Hi, my name is Joanna Mountain. I'm Senior Director of Research at the Personal Genomics Company 23andMe. I'm here with Stephen Nicoletti to discuss our recent publication on the transatlantic slave trade. 23andMe invites our customers to take part in research, and we publish papers on a wide variety of topics, including the slave trade. So today we'll describe the origins of this study, our goals, the data we pulled together, and the discoveries from our analyses. So this study really started well over 10 years ago. It was taken years because prior to joining 23andMe, I had been studying the genetic diversity of peoples across Africa. Then in about 2010, Henry Louis Gates, a professor of African history, showed me this map that summarizes the forced migration of 12 million Africans to the Americas. And when I saw this, I immediately thought to myself that it might be possible to see the impact of this forced migration on the genetics of people across the Americas. However, at that time, we had very few data from people of Atlantic Africa, the source of the enslaved people. So we set out to obtain data from these understudied regions of Africa. So we launched, for instance, the Global Genetics Project to invite people living in the US who had come from those regions to sign up for 23andMe. In that way, by 2018, we had pulled together a genetic database appropriate for studying the transatlantic slave trade. And now I'll turn the mic over to lead author of the study, Stephen Nicoletti, to discuss the details of the study. Thanks, Joanna. Hi, I'm Stephen Nicoletti. I'm a population geneticist at 23andMe, and I'll be taking you through some of the study goals, methods, and results from the study. The transatlantic slave trade was this large triangular event, primarily between Europe, Africa, and the Americas that lasted approximately between 1515 and 1865, so around 400 years. Unfortunately, one of the commodities was human lives and an estimated 12.5 million people were taken from the Atlantic coast of Africa and forced across the Americas. We're interested in what the genetic impact of this event is, taking people from the Atlantic coast of Africa from many different ethno-linguistic groups and forcing them across the Americas where they endured many generations of enslavement. So the goal of this project is to combine genetic data with historical records to make powerful inferences about the transatlantic slave trade. Much of the transatlantic slave trade is understood through historical records, but genetic data has the ability to either solidify these records or fill in any gaps that might exist in these records. So let's look at the data that we used in this study. To study such a large global event, we need global representation of study participants. So I wanna revisit the Atlas from ELTIS 2010, which is based on over 30,000 shipping manifests. Enslaved people over the course of 400 years or so were categorized based on which region they were shipped from. So West Central Africa, the Bites of Biafra and Benin and so on and so forth. So our goal then is to compare these regions of Africa to these different regions of the Americas using present day people whose genetic information tells us a lot about the past. This slide illustrates our study design. We had over 50,000 research participants, the majority of which were 23andMe customers who consented to use their DNA for research. We also had individuals from academic collaborations and public data sets. In the Americas, individuals included in the study had some African ancestry that was presumably from the transatlantic slave trade. In Europe, we had Europeans with European ancestry and in Africa, we had Africans with African ancestry. You can see individuals were broken up into these slave trading regions and regions of the Americas that were present in that atlas that I just showed you in the previous slide. So when I pull in these pie charts that are representing those historical records from shipping manifests, we get an idea of the regions that were most heavily impacted by the transatlantic slave trade. So if we look at this orange region, West Central Africa, which is present day Angola and DRC, we see about 5.7 million people were taken from this region and forced into the Americas. In the Americas, Brazil and surrounding regions had about 5 million enslaved people disembark in them. Now we can contrast this to the United States which is light blue, where about 400,000 enslaved people disembarked. 
It's going to be a theme in this study, this general contrast between Latin America and the rest of the Americas, like the United States and British French Caribbean. I also want to note that 2 million people died en route from Africa to the Americas. That's about 16% mortality of the 12.5 million people taken from Africa. Individuals who passed away on the voyages weren't able to pass on their genes, and therefore they're not going to be represented in this study. Of our 50,000 research participants who are represented by dots here, we can see that there's population structure, basically grouping of individuals by genetic similarity. And this typically corresponds to regions. For instance, countries of South America are more genetically similar than countries that were occupied by the British and French, like the United States and the British French Caribbean. This is just pointing out that people of African descent are highly genetically diverse because of many generations of admixture with European, Native American, and other African populations. So this brings us to our study findings. So when I discuss the results, I'm going to be doing so in the context of these two main genetic analyses. The first is identity by descent, or IBD. And this is an investigation into identical DNA segments that come from a common ancestor. We typically use IBD to determine close relationships like parent, child, or cousins. However, it can be used to detect distant relatives, say ones that lived during the slave trade. And this is because there are these very small segments over time that get broken up that are shared between individuals from a common ancestor. So what we're essentially looking at are these very distant relationships between people of Africa and people of the Americas. And the second analysis is ancestry composition. Many personal genomic services use an analysis similar to this. We basically are able to determine the proportion of an individual's genome that assigns to populations around the world. So we can tell an individual of African descent the proportion of their genome that is European versus African versus Native American, for instance. So our first main result looks at the correlation between DNA shared between Americas and Africa and the shipping records from slavevoyages.org. Our expectation is more embarkation from an African region should be correlated with more genetic representation from that region across all of the Americas. So looking at this pie chart again, a region like West Central Africa that had 5.7 million people taken from it corresponds to higher genetic representation across all of the Americas. So simply put, more people leaving a region of Africa leads to more people reproducing in the Americas and having more genetic representation. This is, however, looking at all of the Americas. However, when we perform a more granular analysis, essentially looking at each region of the Americas compared to each region of Africa, we see that this correlation doesn't always hold true. So this figure is showing genetic connections via IBD on top and recorded disembarkation based on slave voyages records below. If they were correlated with one another, this should look like a mirror image. However, that's not always the case, showing that sometimes there isn't correlation between genetic connections and recorded disembarkation. I highlighted regions that don't have any statistical support for correlation between genetic connections and disembarkation. Those regions are the United States and Northern South America. And I'll be exploring the United States in a little bit more detail. But in general, when we scan across these regions of the Americas, we do see that there's genetic overrepresentation of Nigerian ancestry or genetic connections to the bites of Biafra and Benin and genetic underrepresentation of Senegambia, which is present day Senegal and the Gambia. To help explain some of these discordances, we looked at additional records, literature from history, for instance, that explain other events that were occurring after enslaved people disembarked across the Americas. These generally qualify different accounts, things like rape and mistreatment of enslaved people, but do not quantify them. So the slavevoyages.org shipping manifests give us estimates, solid quantitative data that we can use to compare to our genetic data. 
a lot of these records don't have any quantitative data associated with them. So while we know they were happening, we don't know what sort of frequency they were happening at. So one of our questions is, were these things happening at a frequency high enough that we can observe it in people's genes today? So when we consider this additional literature, we can better explain genetic over and underrepresentation from individuals that came from different regions of Africa. For instance, why might we see underrepresentation of Senegambian in the United States? Literature suggests that Senegambians were rice cultivators during the transatlantic slave trade and typically ended up on rice plantations in the United States. Rice plantations were known to have malarial outbreaks constantly and were known for dangerous work conditions like the potential of drowning in these swampy areas. So because of this, Senegambians might have had lower survival rates because they were dying at higher rates than people from other regions of Africa. Conversely, why do we see an overrepresentation of Nigerian ancestry or individuals from the Bites of Biafra and Benin in the United States? This is likely due to additional forced migrations that occurred over time. We have to understand that people from Africa, when brought to different parts of the Americas, often weren't stationary. They were forced within and between borders. With this, we looked at the intra-American slave trade record base. And it shows us that a lot of individuals were forced from the Caribbean to other parts of the Americas during and after the transatlantic slave trade. Around 40,000 individuals were taken from islands of the British French Caribbean and forced into the United States. We know that Nigerian ancestry was common in many of these islands of the Caribbean. Therefore, these additional forced migrations would spread Nigerian ancestry from the Caribbean to other parts of the world like the United States. This is one potential reason we see Nigerian ancestry so common in the United States. Other scientists have suggested that perhaps people of Nigerian descent also frequently ended up in these breeding programs where they were forced to reproduce with one another. This forced reproduction would lead to the spread of Nigerian ancestry in the US at higher rates than other regions. Another main analysis looked at the proportion of African ancestry in individuals of the Americas of African descent. Our expectation was that regions that had more enslaved people disembarking in them would have more African ancestry. However, we found this was not the case. For instance, Brazil had around 5 million enslaved people disembarking in it over the course of 400 years. However, it has some of the lowest African ancestry being represented in it. Contrast this with the United States that had 400,000 individuals disembarking in it and much higher African ancestry. There's this general contrast between Latin America and the rest of the Americas. We can see this contrast in the Caribbean, for instance. Islands that were occupied by the Spanish and Portuguese typically have lower African ancestry versus ones that were occupied by Northwest Europe. For instance, if we look at Haiti in the Dominican Republic here, they share the same landmass, but Haiti has far higher African ancestry than Dominican Republic has. So why do we see this disparity in terms of African ancestry between Latin America and the rest of the Americas? Literature suggests that in Brazil and other countries of Latin America, there was high enslaved person mortality. This is because it was far more cost effective for these countries to purchase a new enslaved person than it was to worry about their well being. In the United States, where again, enslaved people were coming in at much lower frequencies, it was much more cost effective to force reproduction and maintain breeding forces. So these are two horrible practices. One, say, working enslaved people to death would lead to a decrease in African ancestry because people weren't able to reproduce. The other, forcing reproduction of people of African descent would lead to more representation of African ancestry. So we also investigated the proportions of European ancestry and people of African descent. Our expectation was people of African descent in the Americas will have European ancestry from nations that colonize specific countries. And unfortunately, this usually originates from European slave owners raping their enslaved people. What we see is this does hold true. So in the United States, the most common European ancestry is British and Irish, 
versus Latin America, the most common ancestry is Iberian, so ancestry from Spain and Portugal. So if a European country colonized a certain region of the Americas, their ancestry is present there. So in the same lens, we also estimated sex bias using genetic information. When I say sex bias, I'm referring to the number of African men reproducing to the number of African women. We actually expect that there should be an African man sex bias because there were more African males that were disembarking into regions of the Americas, on average over 60%. However, what we see is there's a bias towards African women reproducing. So on the left here, we're showing the genetic estimation of sex bias. Any value over this dotted line indicates that there's an African woman sex bias. This is in part expected because we know that slave owners, for instance, were raping their enslaved women, and therefore there might be more representation of women. However, what was surprising was the contrast again between the United States and other British French occupied areas to Latin America, places like Northern South America or Central America. So to explain this contrast in sex biases, we went back and looked at the literature and found different pieces that support these findings. For instance, there was this promotion of intermarriage in Latin America, primarily between dark-skinned women and light-skinned men of European descent. In general, darker skin was associated with lower socioeconomic status, so people were actually incentivized to have children that had lighter skin. Also, there was government incentivized immigration of Europeans around the 20th century. Places like Brazil and Cuba actually spent a lot of money trying to incentivize Europeans to migrate into their countries and therefore whiten the country. We also see that census data support this finding. So this is in Cuba, but between 1900 and 2000, the proportion of people classified as non-white fell from 38.2% to 19%. So over time, it appeared that people were becoming more and more white, or at least self-identifying that way. This painting on the left illustrates what was common over generations, basically darker skinned women reproducing with lighter skinned men. And this practice of women of African descent avoiding having children with other men of African descent would actually lead to a high sex bias. So conclusions from our study. There is this overall agreement between shipping records and results from our genetic analyses. That was shown in that correlation graph where if we looked at IBD being shared between each region of Africa and all of the Americas, we can see it's highly correlated. However, when we break down into granular analyses, we see that discordances are present but they're generally consistent with other historical accounts of things like mortality, rape, and national ideologies. What's important here is that genetics is both confirming what we already knew through historical records, but also solidifying that these horrible accounts that lack quantitative data, things like mortality and rape, happened enough that they're observable in the genes of people today. So thank you for listening. If you'd like to hear a deeper dive, please tune into part two, where I'll go into some more details about the analyses. Special thanks to all of the co-authors, people who reviewed and discussed this work, our historian advisors, as well as the 50,000 research participants who consented to research and made this research possible. Thank you.